coming. Um, my name is Richard Colborn. I'm the uh, Middle East Bureau Chief for the BBC, uh, and we're having a session right now. I'm sorry, it's a little bit late to start. Um, on, uh, on the so-called Islamic State, um, whether you call it uh, Daesh, as it's called in large bits of the Middle East, uh, whether you call it ISIS or ISIL, or the BBC in its own way likes to call it the so-called Islamic State, um, it seems a pretty good bet that across this year we're going to spend a lot of time talking about it and there's going to be an awful lot of reporting about, um, about the group, um, in particular perhaps around um, the military operations going on right now um, against the group in Mosul being fought by the Iraqi army and by American coalitions, lots of movements on the ground um, uh, inside Syria around Raqqa and big, de big decisions being taken right now in Washington by the Trump administration around potential forces who could participate in an operation against IS in Raqqa. Um, and it's going to be a you know, massive talking point for the year. Um, not just the, the, the military operation itself, but um, what potentially this year means for the group um, as a military force, but also as an ideological force, as a, as a, 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 a movement inside the Middle East and, and way beyond it as well. Um, so we've got together a really great group of people with pretty unique set of different insights into, uh, into IS and into the, the state of the Middle East um, right now. Um, to my left is um, Faraz Fayad, um, Syrian filmmaker, um, now based in Europe most of the time, yeah, um, and uh, who is um, particularly talking at this event um, about his film The Last Men in Aleppo, which um, uh, was won a big documentary award at the Sundance Film Festival about the White Helmets and about the volunteer movements uh, in the siege of Aleppo at the moment. So it's great to have you. Next to Faraz is Ayman Aghana, uh, a British um, photojournalist, filmmaker, um, uh, of Iraqi origin, uh, uh, based all around the place, <laughs> constantly on the move, um, who's worked, at the moment is doing a lot of stuff for the BBC, but has worked before for the New York Times and Vice News and, and lots of other people as well. And in particular, Ayman's done a lot of work in Iraq, both on the, on the most offensive right now, but, but way before that as well, looking at the different stages of, um, of the operations um, on the ground in Iraq and what it means for the country. And at the end is uh, Rani Rabouzeit, who's been journalist in the Middle East for 15 years at least, um, Australian, uh, born but Lebanese origin, um, uh, and has covered the Middle East for a whole variety of publications, um, lots and lots, but, but particularly I remember back at the beginning of the kind of Syrian conflict, particularly for Time magazine from Beirut, doing lots of um, reporting on undercover trips inside Syria and doing lots of the very kind of early reporting of the opposition movements on the ground and how things were evolving, often in quite dark ways. So um, I thought we'd have a little sort of conversation between us and kind of get things going a bit, um, and then as normal, and then throw it open for kind of questions from the group. So I thought, let's just kind of relatively quickly ask each of you, maybe starting with Rania at the end, um, you know, do you think at the end of this year, by the end of this year, will we be talking about the military defeat of IS? And in a way, if we are, or, or we're getting to that stage, what, what does it actually mean? Islamic State, as we all know, is not a new group. It was formed in the aftermath of the US invasion of Iraq in 2003. The defeat in terms of the territory that it holds might be something, but the defeat of the ideology is something completely different. And it is something that successive Iraqi and uh, US administrations have not been able to do. I remember being in Mosul in 2008, 2009, embedded with the US military, watching them kick in doors trying to defeat the precursor to the Islamic State, and that obviously did not work. So even if it loses territory, that is merely one part of the battle. The bigger idea is how do you kill the idea? How do you kill the, how, how, you know, the, the, and this idea is obviously fermented in an environment. So how do you uh, make the ground infertile for this group's ideas to take root. And that is the bigger question, rather than these tit-for-tat military uh, offensives. I'm in George Press. The what, um, what do you think? Do you, uh, you know, you've particularly been focused on Iraq. What, how do you see things going on the ground right now? And perhaps in particular from Iraq, what does it mean for Iraq, the battle for Mosul? And just to pick up from yeah. what Ronnie said, uh, uh, Daesh, IS, they call themselves the Islamic State? They're the Islamic State. They call themselves the Khmer Rouge. They're the Khmer Rouge. That's what they call themselves. They've been very successful in reducing something very complicated to a very simple idea. 
Um, you mentioned the precursor, uh, U.S. Uh, soldiers kicking down doors with, uh, I mean, there's a lot of different acronyms you used at the time, AQI, ISI, but uh, basically Sunni supremacist uh, extremist groups. Um, where Daesh, IS, Islamic State, have been very successful is they've reduced it to a very simple idea. Before, to, to carry out an operation, Al-Qaeda had a chain of command and a hierarchy. Right now, I could pick up a hammer, shout Allahu Akbar, kill everyone here, right? ISIS would say I'm ISIS. You'd say I'm ISIS. The media would say I'm ISIS. The government would say I'm ISIS. I'm ISIS. That's their success. They've created, uh, they've reduced this very complex thing into a very simple, ugly idea. Um, so it's never going to end. You can never defeat it. You can't defeat it. I've been in prison where I've met IS uh, guys, right? They're fucking warped minds. And on the other side too, these guys who volunteer for the YPG, some of them are right, some of them are fucking crazy. It tracks the warped minds of all over the world. How do you defeat this idea? You can't. This is something we will battle for the rest of our lives. The caliphate will be destroyed on the ground in Iraq within the next month. But the idea will exist forever. What have I seen on the ground? Okay, well, we're in Italy, so we're in Europe. Let me talk about what the threats we face as Europeans or citizens of the free world. Uh, drones, UAVs, major problem for Iraqi forces. They literally do not know how to stop them. We're talking uh, 70 uh, drone drops a day on forces going in. Now, these are commercial drones, little tiny things that you can buy from Amazon. Uh, dropping tiny payloads, what uh, military would say, 40 mic mic. Uh, to, in layman's terms, if you've seen Rambo and he's got a machine gun, underneath his machine gun is a little grenade launcher, firing little grenades. I've seen firsthand these little grenades drop so accurately that they can destroy and incinerate five men at a time. I'm talking about 70 of these a day. Pretty soon, I think we're going to see attacks in Europe, drone-based, and we still haven't found an effective deterrent. Uh, the coalition, oh, well, we, well, fuck it, can I get into it? Yeah. All right. So uh, I've had like pretty candid conversation with Iraqi special forces guys about how to uh, combat this threat. And there is no easy answer. The coalition has frequencies, uh, whatever, jamming technology. The problem is when you crank that up to 11, predator drones start falling out of the sky. So whatever option, and also your comms are gone. So you can't communicate to your, your, your soldiers. So what else do you do? Uh, the French and the Europeans, they're, they're training birds of prey to take these down. I think that's an effective idea. Um, they've got these like little ray gun things that look like something out of a comic book from the 1950s. They're not very effective. But I think pretty soon Europe is going to have to uh, start thinking about how to realistically deal with the threat from UAVs once the caliphate is destroyed on the ground in Iraq and Syria. And the... You know, Iraq and Syria is a testing ground for terrorism, uh, which we will all face and continue to face and face now. Um, so I think we need to really develop our ideas about how we combat the UAV threat. And, and in lots of your reporting, you've spent time with these young Iraqi special forces, guys on the ground um, who have grown up through these different operations we've seen in Iraq. So what, in a way, what does this year mean for Iraq in terms of the military operation, but also symbolically? What, what's the sort of stake in terms of the success or failure in the operation? Look, I mean, the Iraqis of, of martial people who, are, despite all the sectarianism, are proud of their country, and they're very proud of their soldiers who are fighting this war. And when they take Mosul, it'll be a big victory for the soldiers and for the citizens who support the soldiers. Unfortunately... The Americans couldn't do it. You think Baghdad can do it? You know, like, it doesn't matter. The battle doesn't matter. What happens after the battle matters. What's that quote from the Charlie Wilson? Like, uh, we did a great thing, but then we fucked up the end game. Yeah, yeah. So it's what comes next. So for us, from your perspective, what, what do you think this year might bring? And in a way, how do you think Syrians watch the kind of conflict against IS on the ground are potentially coming in, in, in Raqqa, um, given the whole scale of the wider conflict that's going on in Syria as well. Um, what do people think might come this year and, 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 and how important do they actually think it is? For, uh, for the Syrian, it's like leaves alone 
around three years, they'll like ISIS, the, the idea of ISIS like start to, to grow up in, in front of them and, um, and a lot of killing and the losing around them and uh, nobody left for them. And uh, with Obama red lines, nothing, uh, n nobody care about how much people kill there. And then um, for, for the Syrian now, most important things remove who's established ISIS, stop who established ISIS, because if we want to stop ISIS, then we have to think who support ISIS, who is like create and push the people to join ISIS because of the anger, because um, uh, the idea of losing, or because of the, the lack of the hope and uh, all of these things and the open border for people and uh, uh, close the border in front of other peoples, and uh, this is one of the big, big things. But actually, and I'm going like to the other side. There is many ways for that support the civil society, which is like starting from uh, civil movement, um, including like uh, uh, white helmets, which is they are those like a group of the. Uh, volunteer who is like um, they are the first to respond on the heavy bomb from the Assad regime first in 2013 then in uh, then when uh, the Russian um, start to bomb Aleppo in 2015 when uh, the idea of white helmet start this is people they just like this is the uh, start like as a ground to to attract all all of this is young people from <coughs> 15 till uh, 13 and um, one of the big idea like against the Al Qaeda and against all of this is a tourism group or uh, armed group or ISIS and um, but unfortunately who is help ISIS now who is attack white helmet and attack this is civilians group and the, the humanitarian volunteer when they when they say like when they attack them like uh, uh, vocally or with a propaganda when they say like the white helmet's enemy and the left wing in europe and the, uh, the russian propaganda that's help isis because all of this is people who is like when when they stop the the supporting for the white helmet when they stop support for the 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 syrian civil society then then isis will Will grow up, and then uh, the area that they they held the ground of I, uh, the ground for ISIS and other other group that to to establish different way. If they killed ISIS, they, they will not end of ISIS. They will uh, they will help for other uh, other anger group to. To, to, to begin. And, and when you see some of the media reporting and get a sense of the discussions going on, for example, about who, is, who might fight against ISIS in yeah. Raqqa, do you worry that there's a single sort of focus on Raqqa as a stronghold and not enough thought to, to the rest of the conflict and to, and, to, and to ending all these other conflicts breaking out of different parts of Syria, which can fuel that kind of radicalization? Yeah, actually, when, when we go the, like to Raqqa, let's, let's, let, let's think about the, the American and Elias bump for Raqqa, what, 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 they, what, what they do, and who, who, who is killed. When we, we, we count who the victim there, we, we will see the civilians, children and uh, civilians and uh, the people who is really fight ISIS and who is the, uh, lose their life. Because ISIS will not wait like the American uh, uh, drone to, to bomb them because this is people they coming from the very long experience before Iraq and um, uh, starting from... Um, actually, I've, I've, I've been in Syria f um, from nine, nine months. I was making a documentary about the uh, Uzbek. And I meet one of the leader of the Uzbek. And the leader of Uzbek, when I'm asking him about who's your enemy and who's fighting in Syria, he said, like, we actually now, one of the, they have two enemies. The first enemy is China. The second enemy is ISIS. And uh, the idea of ISIS, as he said, it's a start for him, like, from... Uh, from long time before Afghanistan, when they established like Al Qaeda, when this is like a problem between Osama bin Laden and the other uh, the other side of the, um, the the it's like left and right wing, <laughs> left side and right side from the Al Qaeda, mm -hmm. and he said uh, he said the idea of ISIS is already established from that time and the transfer. To Algeria and then Morocco and then end in in Iraq and then grow up in Iraq after the American um, bomb for Iraq and then in in Syria and this just it's a result from from all of that and they find this is the ground because who's helped them who will help them like the who's like 
who is like leave the reason behind all this is um, uh, jihadist who is coming to Syria uh, from uh, bo uh, open borders and uh, with uh, with a dictatorship who is still like like a crazy go like to bump Aleppo with uh, 250,000 civilians they and uh, like arrested uh, the humanitarian worker like they arrested like when they forced to leave the, the people in Aleppo they they arrested two of uh, white helmets and they forced forced them in the television to say like uh, the white helmet is um, a bad, a bad idea, we are acting and we are in Hollywood mm -hmm. films and uh, we doing like all of these things. Mm -hmm. Then if they leave Assad, ISIS will still keep going mm -hmm. and grow up. And if they destroyed ISIS, with, uh, uh, even if Assad there, there is idea, other idea, yeah. like ISIS will grow up because the, this, is, this is who is the dictatorship who support the racism and the hate, mm -hmm. the hater and the anger of of of, of all of these people and the, the other group who to, to to be together to get mm -hmm. a ground for their uh, and, goals. And, and Rani, do you think we are over-reporting ISIS to the exclusion of other pictures in in Iraq or Syria or beyond? No, I think that there is a um, an obsession with ISIS. I think that. Um, in pursuing this obsession, we actually feed into the narrative of the group. And I've said this before, that the group wants to be the boogeyman in every nightmare. And we help it to be that. And it serves two purposes. One, for its constituents and for the people that it wants to recruit. And secondly, for its enemies. And it wants this. And I think that it's, um, it's uh, unhealthy or irresponsible. There's a spectrum that every time something blows up in Europe or elsewhere, the speculation begins, this is Islamic State. And we feed it, and that's what they want. We are actually doing the group's bidding by, by, uh, by uh, fueling this narrative, because that's what it wants. And I think that's uh, dangerous, and I think that we need to acknowledge our role in that. And but but, but given, given the military operations on the ground and given the attacks we've seen outside, um, how should, how should the media handle them as a group? What, what, what should, how should the, should the reporting be different? Well, I mean, I don't know about the media. The media is a big word, you know, mm. and encompasses many, many different groups, so I'm, I'm loath to generalize. However, I mean, you know, as Ayman said, if he just picks up a hammer and, and you know, attacks people, it, you know, Islamic State can claim it. It can say that it inspired this person, and, uh, you know, that is a very slippery slope. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the former spokesperson of uh, Islamic State, uh, Abu Muhammad al-Adnani, once uh, famously said, you know, attack the, attack the enemy. If you can't shoot him or bomb him, uh, run, run him over with a car. If you can't do that, you know, uh, stab him. If you can't do that, spit on him. Thereby establishing the, the, the spectrum, like, you know, that any attack can be claimed by Islamic State and be claimed as, you know, IS-inspired. And that's something that I think that we as the media need to be wary of, and we need to be a little bit more sophisticated in our um, reporting of events and uh, attacks. And just, you know, maybe hold our fire a bit until some of the facts are established before we start speculating about whether or not it's Islamic State and thereby uh, fattening the boogeyman in our nightmares. And I mean, what, what do you see as being the, some of the limitations, inevitably, of, of our ability to report in these countries right now and also on some of these groups and some of these movements um, in terms of trying to get to players on the ground but also to the kind of truth of the situation? Well, because it's a very sensitive... Um, because it's a very sensitive topic, um, governments spy intervene, prevent media from getting to the story. Mm -hmm. That's one. <laughs> mm -hmm. Two. Um, I'd like to pick up on what Rani was just saying. Uh, what feeds the narrative of ISIS, Islamic State, Daesh, whatever. There is this idea, it was made famous by Huntington, you know, the clash of civilizations, right? ISIS, their simple, ugly idea, the West versus Islam. At the same time, we feed that narrative, as she very well says, by saying, we don't want no Muslims around here. <laughs> want to burn your Quran. Or bloody immigrants coming over here with their fucking, fucking Sharia law, fucking all this, you know, all that. That fuels it. That's it. It's a simple 
dichotomy, and they feed off each other. When you reduce the world into these very simple reductive camps, you have a conflict and a cycle of violence that will continue and fuel and never end. And Rania, certainly, this is kind of a point slightly wider than just IS, but in the last year or so, there's been a certain amount of sort of criticism of media reporting in terms of um, a painting a kind of quite a simplistic approach to conflict, particularly the Syria conflict in terms of black and white from 2011 to now. Um, not, not perhaps misreporting the Syrian opposition in the early stages of, of, of the conflict, um, seeing them into rosier, rosier view, not foreseeing some of the things that shifted on the ground. Do you share that criticism in some ways in terms of the, the, way, the way coverage has evolved from 2011 to now? I mean, once again, I think it's unfair to, to you know, paint with, broad, with a broad brush. I mean, you can't you know, talk about the media. You can speak about certain journalists, about certain organizations, perhaps, but you certainly can't speak about the media. And let's not also forget that uh, this is a very complicated conflict, and nuance is messy, and editors often don't want messy. They want you know, good guys and bad guys, so we can't sort of you know, put too much of the blame on... Uh, I mean, you know, we can't, we can't speak in generalizations. Um, and, you know, there's also the element of, you know, learning as we, as we proceed. And this is also something that, uh, you know, it's, it's very easy to look back retrospectively and say, well, you know, we should have known this. But having said that, I mean, I remember uh, after Islamic State took Mosul, I did a lot of media, and many of the journalists would ask me, well, where did this group suddenly come from? What do you mean, where did they suddenly come from? We've been report, we, we had been reporting it for years beforehand. So there's also an, an element of like, you know, we were reporting it, but who was listening? Who was paying attention? Who was reading what we were writing and what we were reporting? And did it just go into some kind of void? And then all of a sudden, you know, Islamic State marches into Mosul and it's a story. So, you know, the, there is, there is, the blame can be widespread. Mm. It can mm. be spread on many different shoulders in terms of uh, uh, understanding. You know, d don't tell me you don't know what's happening in Syria. There's a lot of information about mm. what's happening in Syria. We have lost friends reporting on Syria and on Iraq. And, you know, there are many, many brave Syrian journalists who are often unnamed, who have lost their lives reporting on what has happened to try and tell us what is happening in their own country. So let's also, you know, accept some of the blame. Are we, are we actually following it? Or are we turning away from that information? So we, we, we need to take a good hard look at ourselves and don't tell me you don't know what's happening in Syria. The information is there. It's about whether or not you're prepared to accept and absorb some of the ugly truth. And it is ugly and it is hard to read and it is hard to see, but the information is out there. Thank you. Should we throw some questions for the panel about their experiences, about some of the discussions, some of the questions about coverage? Yep. Uh, I'm, an, uh, I'm a Russian journalist, and I wanted to ask you about the challenges you face covering the Russian military involvement in Syria, because it uh, it's looks like a very complicated story. We have boots on the ground, and uh, we have troops, we have private military companies, we have awful bombings. And back in Russia, it's extremely difficult to cover. Uh, we have only pieces of information. So what's, what's going on on your side? Does everyone want to take that? <laughs> For us, yeah. Excuse me, uh, the Russian can't cover Syria? This is my question. I don't think that you can go to cover Syria. How is Russian, Russian today one of the biggest, biggest media can enter to Syria and covering what's going on from the side of the regime? And all the time they hide the information and uh, they make a propaganda against the Syrian and they, 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 they don't... I, I think it's a, brave, it's, it's a decision from the journalist. If there is a brave enough journalist, he wants to tell the story for the, their own people. He can't take this decision and go and report about Syria if they're, yeah. Sorry to interrupt, and uh, <laughs> this may fuck me up for the rest of my life, but uh, there are no independent journalists in Russia. There is no opposition in Russia. Russia is an autocratic state. You have no information because you're not allowed information. There were bombings in St. Petersburg yesterday. I don't believe the, I don't believe the numbers because there's no independent information. It's not a free country. 
get killed. Excuse me. I worked for Nova Gazette. We have six people killed. Well, and we have some good reporting. So I think it's just not... Well, when you say well, you cannot talk about all media and generalization, I think that's one of the threats. You try to I'm generalize ignorant. everything. I'm ignorant. I'm sorry to uh, insult you. I have utmost respect for your colleagues and yourself for reporting in Russia. I'm very ignorant. I've never been... I don't know even, I can't even name two cities, three maybe. I don't know anything about it. But That's why uh, I ask you how you, but because for us it's a big problem. We understand that we have this problem about uh, yeah. the Russian military involvement in Syria as we have the problem of Russian military involvement in Ukraine. And I just wanted to ask you as journalist, because I'm a journalist, and just ask you a professional question. How you deal with this very difficult challenge? Because you cannot be embedded with the Russian troops. Yeah. So how you can cover this issue? I, d I don't think I it's... I think it's a it, fair it, yeah. professional should I say, question. Should I say, in terms of the BBC's experience, yeah. look, I mean, like lots of ways, the Syrian conflict, the, one of the real frustrations is is we get little access to, to little kind of to, to snippets of it. And so, you know, we, along with um, some other media organizations, have, have had trips with the Russian military um, in, in under considerable restrictions, obviously, in terms of where we can go to, what we can see. We get a snapshot of what's going on. It's very limiting in a, in a way, similar frustrations involved in going into Syria with a visa and seeing the government side, similar frustrations often with going in with the opposition as well. So it's a, it's a very sort of similar scenario. I think what's quite interesting for me in terms of some recent BBC reporting, for the first time I actually saw that on a, on a uh, trip in with a team of the Syrian government um, visa through Damascus, they were seeing Russian military police on the ground involved in some of the evacuations going on in, in um, some of the towns in, uh, inside Syria as part of these deals that have been much criticised with the government to pull people out of besieged towns. And it was, it was very interesting for them on a, on a trip for the first time, not, not with the Russian military, to see quite openly you know, Russian military on the ground. That was pretty unusual for us. Should we take another question? From, yeah. It is. Uh, my name is Zainar Hayim. Uh, I am a Syrian journalist. Um, I believe covering what's going on in Syria from an independent Russian is really essential. And me as a journalist who is trying to help other journalists in Russia, I've never been reached. I'm available on Twitter. I've been reached <laughs> by many other international journalists trying um, to kind of ask me uh, to put them in touch with other contacts. I can even translate, but I've never been reached by any uh, Russian journalist. I'm happy to help. I think many Syrians would love to make their voices heard in Russia. Um, during the campaigns of stop the bombing of Aleppo, stop the evacuation, um, many Russian activists help in translating whatever we're tweeting into Russian. But sadly, we didn't find any kind of collaboration from Russian oppositions who are abroad or from Russian, uh, from Russian independent journalists who are living inside. I believe many activists, many journalists are willing to help, but you just need to reach up to them. Um, uh, very quickly uh, on another point, I think I, I completely agree with Rania about overcovering ISIS. Mm -hmm. And this is not only fueling um, their hatred or their propaganda, but it also uh, kind of it weakens the opposition who is trying to fight them. Because whatever happens, whatever a big massacre, a big gas massacre happened, like the one that happened two days ago, it, do it doesn't, in the best case scenario, have two headlines. The same massacre, if it happens by ISIS in the same area, killing the same people, you will find it all over the world. So they do have the media privilege of taking the attention, which make it really frustrating for those who are trying to defend themselves or to defend themselves against ISIS or against the regime. It's, it's really sad and frustrating for a uh, for Syrian or for a Syrian journalist. If you're a freelancer and you're pitching any story for international media, it has to have an ISIS element. Otherwise, it will be completely rejected. Um, so they do want you to keep speaking about those and neglecting all the other issue, which is the main uh, big problems. There is another issue with the international media I notice is that they do have this sense of considering all Syrians living under ISIS territories as pro-ISIS not as those who are oppressed by ISIS. I don't think I've read anything saying that Syrian journalists and Syrian activists and Syrians in general are the most who are being terrorized by ISIS. We've, they've killed of us and the Iraqis more than any other international um, foreigner in, in, in the world. And despite that, you only remember those who are killed by ISIS if they have non-Syrian cursed passports. 
This is also another issue that I think it, it is really against the Syrians' will. Thank you. Uh, another question? Gentleman just behind, yep. Yeah, um, my question is, um, if I claimed, if I say that I'm an elephant, you won't believe me, but ISIS it called itself Islamic State, even if it doesn't share nothing with Islam. It starts their propaganda, it starts from their name. Because if we talk like to an average not Muslim person, and we say the word Islam, I, I'm a Muslim and I'm living in Italy, I'm an Italian citizen. When I talk to my friends and I tell them Islam, the first thing they, t they, they think about is about terrorism, is about the Islamic State. Shouldn't we stop to call them like Islamic State so we destroy their propaganda? Jonathan? I live in a free country. I have a legal right to name my son Jesus Christ fucks pigs. Does it mean Jesus Christ fucks pigs? No, but it's his name. Rania, what's your perspective on the, the, great, the great Islamic State naming debate? What, what do I say after that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, if, if they think that Islam is represented by Islamic State, then, you know, we have bigger problems than the naming of a group. As Zaina, you know, correctly said, Islamic State has killed more Muslims than it has killed of any other group of people. And this is something that we need to remind people when they talk about, you know, Islamic State. Most of its victims are Muslims. Most of its victims are Syrians and Iraqis. And let's not forget that the first group of people who took on Islamic State were the Syrians. In 2014, I was in Syria when within a matter of weeks, Islamic State was kicked out of three provinces in Syria and pushed back into Raqqa. The Syrians took them on with very little assistance from, from, from other groups and they kicked them out of their own environment. And this is something that I think is often overlooked when you talk about you know, Islamic State and, and its enemies and who it harms most. I mean, if the group has had a falling out with Al-Qaeda, that will give you an indication of just how fringe it is with regard to Islamist movements. Forget about Islam, we're talking about like, you know, Islamist movements, groups that want to restore a caliphate, don't agree with Islamic State. So that should be an indication of just how Islamic the group is with regard to other Muslims. Thanks. Go on the front. Oh, yeah, right. Try that first and then we'll cover. Sorry, yeah, just a quick question. Um, just for some of you who've, who've perhaps covered several different conflicts, have you, do you feel that you've been in this position before where you can see the end game in, in sight, where like, just like you could perhaps foretell the downfall of Saddam and you could, you could see that the end was in sight for the Tamil Tigers or the Colonel Gaddafi? Or, do you get this, this sense that like, you've made mistakes in the past when, you, when you've been in this kind of phase of the story and are there kind of... Are there ways in which you can kind of avoid making the same mistakes now? <laughs> no, 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 Jim. Jim? God, I don't know. That's a very tough question. Um, no, I'm, I'm certainly, uh, I'm certainly loath to, to try and predict what's going to happen with um, uh, the so-called Islamic State, and and, uh, and and wouldn't have any confidence whatsoever in some sort of prediction. And I think, as we were raising earlier on, the kind of very active discussion is even if you think you can predict the, the fall of, you know, the, the end of IS as a fighting presence in Mosul or even in Raqqa, what does that mean? I mean, you know, when you talk to military officials, government officials, they talk about IS as a, as a group that holds territory. Potentially the, the end may be in sight for that. That's not necessarily a particularly bold prediction, perhaps. But, but, but the end of IS as an insurgent force inside the kind of conflicts in Syria and Iraq. The end of IS as a, a, a group organizing attacks in Europe, radicalizing people, all the things we discussed earlier on. Uh, you know, I, I think we'd be loath to, to predict, predict how that's going to play out anytime soon. Yeah, um, I'd like to uh, comment, make a couple of short comments. Firstly, um, on the issue of name, um, they call themselves Islamic State. I mean, a lot of communist countries call themselves democratic. Uh, that, that doesn't mean we should stop calling them what they call themselves. But then that introduces the need for nuance and contextualization. You know, because, you know, basically, if you don't call them Islamic State, you're doing what they do, takfiri. You know, you're saying, you know, 
uh, you're outside the community of Islam, huh? uh, you know, uh, you're excommunicating like they do. I mean, they do it on a much larger scale. You're, you're excommunicating a tiny minority of Muslims, whereas they excommunicate 95 or 99% of Muslims. Uh, so that's one issue. The issue then that comes, stems from that is nuance and contextualization. Uh, like Rania was saying, uh, uh, there's this uh, um, this uh, like uh, phantom menace called the Islamic State, which has been blown out of all proportions. It is a menace, an immense menace to Syrians and Iraqis, but to the outside world, and this is like a job that's important to be done, you know, by the media, but also by the consumers of the media, because the consumers of the media, a lot of them are looking for simplistic, straightforward answers. And some of the real answers will actually hurt the consumer of the media as much as the biases uh, and prejudices of journalists themselves because it's a complex beast. It's a weak beast because, you know, reverting to, t to just inspirational attacks like, like telling people do what you can to kill the infidel, that's actually a sign of extreme weakness, not strength. Um, uh, you know, uh, the fact that they're fighting mostly a propaganda war on a global stage, you know, is a sign of weakness, not strength, you know. Uh, so th there's that issue. There's the issue of uh, nuance and contextualization um, because, you know, there's a, part of the blame uh, for the rise of Islamic State is with, with Arab regimes, Part of the blame for it is with uh, uh, conservative Muslims who simplistically portray the world in black and white. Part of the blame is on the West, you know, for short-sighted uh, interventions and invasions and, uh, uh, you know, tr trying to um, um, often uh, uh, using high values as a, a mask for other uh, interests, uh, you know, and, you know, uh, so, so that, that makes it, you know, uh, that spreads the blame on a lot of players, and that's sometimes something that's hard to stomach for, for both uh, the media and for the consumers of news. Fair enough. Any other thoughts? Any questions? Can I yeah. Who in this room who in this room, raise your hands, does not have a university or college degree? <laughs> not <yet>. <laughs> <laughs> but you're studying? Progress. You're studying, or you? Yeah. So everyone. So we're educated, right? So Khaled, it's all very well to talk about nuance. Yeah. That's a lot of <laughs> but... We can talk about nuance while drinking Sangiovese and eating cheese or whatever, but uh, the reality is 99.9% .9 of the population don't ha appreciate our sense of nuance. And they listen to Coldplay and vote for fascists. <laughs> Coldplay is <laughs> fucking sad. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's true. I, I'm not, and I love you, and, I pre and everything else you said was awesome. I just wanted to make that point. <laughs> that we're incredibly privileged here, and we can discuss this all we want, but what impact does it really have? Like, does the Daily Mail reader understand the nuance? Does the Fox, uh, does the Jazeera, does, they, they don't understand the nuance. So sometimes uh, shorthand uh, serves a purpose. But your, but your point is also one about context in terms of the propaganda point, which is quite an interesting one, about are you saying that the media should sometimes be more robust about calling out the propaganda as an example of weakness riding, rather than feeding into sort of a fear? You know, this is a lone wolf, If that, yeah. ISIS jumped on the propaganda Yeah. No, everyone, everyone. The mainstream media swallowed it wholesale, you know, which is only strengthening them because, you know, you know, it's kind of like, you know, the, you know, if this continues along this path, it'll be the, one of the first instances in history that, you know, you know, a, a weak party has defeated a strong party through propaganda, mostly propaganda. You know? So, because Rani, you mentioned a bit earlier about over-reporting. So, so, do you think it's a question of? 
of reporting them less or reporting them better in terms of that point about... Uh, uh, better. Uh, better. Better. It's never about reporting less. Yeah. I mean, for us as journalists, more information is always better information. But it's the quality of the information. It's about facts versus speculation. It's about not jumping on Twitter every time there's a, you know, a, a shooting in, in Parliament and speculating as to whether or not it is Islamic State. It's waiting for information. It's what we're supposed to do. And I think that that's what we need to, to focus on, we, what we need to remember. Yeah. Uh, pardon me. For the gentleman from the BBC, uh, what I've heard a, a bit from the correspondents is that there is a problem at the editorial level, that the story they have in their notebook um, maybe is turned away from by the reader, but also has to get past an editorial buffer that maybe is turning some of the nuance back. And since, if I understand correctly, you oversee coverage in the region, I'm curious if you, if you think that we have, as an industry, a problem at the editorial level where we need to you know, send, um, promote some of the people who've spent the 10 years on the ground, as it sounds like you have, or the 20, and those conversations maybe are a little bit richer or more complicated. Or, or maybe I'm wrong, and they're not actually running into that no, I, I think, I think if you I think if you look across the Thanks. reporting from the Middle East, uh, on, on lots of the, the, the mainstream media, the, the large organizations, particularly in English, which I'm obviously familiar with, you know, there's, a, there's an incredible amount of expertise and sort of talent and, and, and correspondence with a lot of experience on the ground involved in that. Um, I, I think, yeah, I think, I think it's often a, often a question of the space for, for the context, you know, the space for some of the points you're making in terms of potentially the kind of the analysis of IS propaganda not falling into traps over um, over suggesting that necessarily attacks or, or uh, claims for attacks of their own propaganda implies a strength to the organization that, that possibly doesn't exist there. Um, look, I think, uh, speaking of the BBC, I think if you look across our reporting of the Middle East, you will find plenty of examples of, of good reporting looking at IS, where do they come from? You know, what are the motivations of the group? How strong are they actually? Um, I think driving that into the day-to-day -day coverage of news stories day in, day out is a real challenge in terms of kind of getting the space always for that, for that sort of context, but it, but it is there. Um, I mean, how, when you, how do you find it when you're talking to editors and publishers? We were talking about this about, about, <laughs> talking a bit about this earlier on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Yeah. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Don't worry. Yeah. Do, you, do you find, and when you talk to colleagues, do you find that, that uh, there's not an appetite for stories um, of yes. the sort that you would like to do? Yes. Mm. Yes, very much so. I find that uh, Islamic State is... Uh, it's too prevalent in the minds of editors. I mean, I was in Syria recent, last year. I went into Idlib City, a place where nobody has been. And editors weren't interested in the story because there's no Islamic State presence in Idlib City. Yet Idlib City is still a story. It's important. It's about, it's only the second provincial capital that has fallen from the Assad regime and questions about its governance are important. And tell them how hard it is to get there. Well, yeah, it's, it, it's hard to get there, to, to put it very mildly. But, I mean, you know, once again, it's like, oh, there's no Islamic State. It's not sexy. And, and I think that this is something that Syrian, you know, reporting of Syria has suffered from because it's, uh, you know, it's like, I don't know, editors get, you know, somebody says something about Aleppo, so everybody covers Aleppo as if Aleppo was the only thing in Syria, whereas there are lots of other things that are also happening. We're talking about civil governance, we're talking about the White Helmets, we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, local movements inside other cities, but it's like... You've got the one thing in your mind, and it's like a flashing light, and that's, what's, that's what defines Syria in the news and cycle. A fem female movement also, because all the time when I make a last minute in Aleppo, all the time, where the, where the female? And I told them this is about the White Helmets work as a man, and there is a, f a lot of female feminists, but I'm not going to make all, all the stories about Syria. You, ha you have the responsibility also to make stories about the female. Look, hey, uh, Zena, like, she's, uh, she worked in Aleppo for, for three years, more than four, four years, like, working alone, and, uh, like, uh, she teaching a lot of, uh, of activity, uh, activists, uh, female, and they make a beautiful yeah. female movement, and uh, nobody will support them. Yeah. Nobody care. Nobody want, want them because they are not ISIS. If you make uh, something about ISIS, the all... 
yeah. <laughs> I, but come, come back, I mean, yeah, I would, I would agree with all of that. And I think certainly if you look across the last year or so, I sort of get a sense of, you know, after obviously after years of these conflicts now, now rumbling, you get the kind of moments like Aleppo at the tail end of last year, particularly horrendous attacks, and suddenly the eyes of the world are back on those. And then you get a certain other layer of stories which are fit very into new Trump administration, geopolitics, Russia, you know, American troops on the ground, battles for Mosul, battles for Raqqa, and there's a sort of appetite for that. But the wider spread of reporting across um, Syria and Iraq and, and other bits of the Middle East isn't, isn't, isn't there in the same way as it was, you know, three, four years ago, for sure. Yeah. Sometimes you can use a news agenda to subvert Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you can use a news agenda as a hook to, yeah. to take you in another for sure. direction. For yeah. example, all the interest in ISIS has led me to sometimes use ISIS as a launching point for other things. Like, you know, after one attack ISIS carried out, I wrote, uh, okay, I, I'm more into analysis and opinion, but at the moment, I wrote a piece about how ISIS disproves the clash of civilizations theory. Yeah. You know? yeah. No, you're um, right, and, and it'll be very interesting to see in Mosul you know, the sense that if, you know, if, if, if Islamic State completely falls from Mosul, is that the end of the story for, for most of the media? Whereas actually in many ways it's the beginning for a whole group of really, you know, a whole set of really important stories about the future of Iraq, the future yeah, of state uh, Iraq. Yeah, one month Islamic State will be defeated uh, on the battle space as a military conventional force. Does that mean it's going to go away? No, man. Mosul has always been a bad city. Yeah, yeah. It's always been bad. Only since we had the brand ISIS... We care yeah. about it. Yeah. Like and the really a, interesting stories will be later in the year when we're looking at what does Mosul look like now? What's the state of Even now, of the go to army. Eastern Mosul now. Go to Anbar, man. Mm. No one gives a shit about it. Sorry, I swear a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're grown ups. Um, Anbar. Anbar was the first place uh, ISIS appeared. And, uh, no one really cares about it except the Americans because they bled there. Um, that area has been liberated from ISIS uh, for a long time. It's not like rivers of uh, chocolate and rainbows. It's, it's pretty horrible, you know, like the situation is really bad. Corruption is really bad. The guys who went in to hold the ground afterwards are gangsters. They torture and murder and rob and loot and quote unquote ISIS or Sunni supremacists, the individuals and organizations continue to live there and continue their criminal and terrorist activities. So yeah, on the battle space, yeah, we'll defeat ISIS. Uh, is it gonna go away? No, and like I said, it is coming here. Ban drones, <laughs> ban them. <laughs> I think we've maybe got time for one more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, concerning the young Europeans or young uh, Americans that joined uh, ISIS, what's your opinion on the media coverage about this issue? Do you think that sometimes it's been uh, caricaturized, uh, portrayed as like they are loonies that just seek for adventure, or in the case of females that are also having a role in the caliphate, they are also portrayed like uh, seeking love for the jihadi or this kind of things? Randy, what do you think? I mean, certainly in Britain, there's been a whole spate of stories about radicalization, you know, a fascination with, with young Britons, mums with their children going into Syria from Turkey. Uh, is that overblown? Oh. I mean, you know, once again, you can't generalize. People join the group for many different reasons. Some of them join it because they believe that it represents the Islam that it represents Islam and that it is a group that uh, does not merely talk about uh, restoring a caliphate, but that has actually done so. Others join it because they're escaping from troubles back home or because they think that it can mean that they're somebody special for a sense of power, for a sense of uh, importance, for a sense of adventure. There are many different reasons why people join these groups, and I think that we have to be careful not to overgeneralize. <coughs> Because they're, you know, I mean, it's it's uh, it's complicated, and you know, some people, may, you know, many people simply don't have that understanding of Islam. They merely join it because they think it's the biggest, baddest group on the ground. I mean, you know, I speak with, um, uh, like, with my Nusra. They used to be called Nusra. They were the the local Al Syrian Al Qaeda affiliate, and you know, many of those guys were complaining about how Islamic State had better recruitment, and that they were losing out. 
to, uh, to Islamic State because they had better media outreach and that they were recruiting more people um, and that they were, so, they were losing the battle for, for, uh, for, for recruits into this organization because they portray themselves as an Islamic State. Um, and, you know, there, there are lots of people who are in uh, Islamic State, you know, defectors who I've talked to who had very little understanding of Islam. It was simply because they thought that they were, uh, you know, some of them were criminals who simply joined the group because it was the strongest group on the ground and therefore they found some sense of protection that nobody could touch them because they were considered Islamic State. Uh, so, you know, that's also a factor. So I think we have to be careful when we uh, speak about motivations, not to sort of uh, oversimplify things and to remember that there isn't one size that fits all. I think we've got to wrap it up there. Thank you very much, Anita, everybody. Thanks for a really interesting <coughs> comments from the group. Watch out for Russians. <laughs> so, who, so, so, drones and the AI, exactly. Yeah, yeah. We're going to be lynched by independent Russian journalists. Yeah, oh, well, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. <laughs> it's got a tendency, it's the safest place. <laughs> Created, uh, they've reduced this very complex thing into a very simple, ugly idea. Um, so it's never going to end. You can never defeat it. You can't defeat. I've been in prison where I've met IS uh, guys, right? They're fucking warped minds. And on the other side, too, these guys who volunteer for the YPG, some of them are right, some of them are fucking crazy. It attracts the warped minds of all over the world. How do you defeat this idea? You can't. This is something we will battle for the rest of our lives. The caliphate will be destroyed on the ground in Iraq within the next month. But the idea will exist forever. What have I seen on the ground? Okay, well, we're in Italy, so we're in Europe. Let me talk about what the threats we face as Europeans or citizens of the free world. Uh, drones, UAVs, major problem for Iraqi forces. They literally do not know how to stop them. We're talking uh, 70 uh, drone drops a day on forces going in. Now, these are commercial drones, little tiny things that you can buy from Amazon. Uh, dropping tiny payloads, what uh, military would say, 40 mic mic. Uh, to, in layman's terms, if you've seen Rambo and he's got a machine gun, underneath his machine gun is a little grenade launcher firing little grenades. I've seen firsthand these little grenades drop so accurately that they can destroy and incinerate five men at a time. I'm talking about 70 of these a day. Pretty soon, I think we're going to see attacks in Europe drone based coming um my name is richard colborn i'm the uh, middle east bureau chief for the bbc uh and we're having a session right now i'm sorry it's a little bit late to start um on uh on the so-called islamic state um whether you call it uh, Daesh, as it's called in large bits of the middle east uh whether you call it isis or isil or the bbc in its own way likes to call it the so-called islamic state um it seems a pretty good bet that across this year we're going to spend a lot of time talking about it and there's going to be an awful lot of reporting about, um, about the group, um, in particular perhaps around um, the military operations going on right now um, against the group in Mosul being fought by the Iraqi army and by American coalitions, lots of movements on the ground um, uh, inside Syria around Raqqa and big, de big decisions being taken right now in Washington by the Trump administration around potential forces who could participate in an operation against IS in Raqqa. Um, and it's going to be a you know, massive talking point for the year. Um, not just the, the, the military operation itself, but um, what potentially this year means for the group um, as a military force, but also as an ideological force, as a, as a, 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 a movement inside the Middle East and, and way beyond it as well. Um, so we've got together a really great group of people with pretty unique set of different insights into, uh, into IS and into the, the state of the Middle East um, right now, quite dark ways. So um, I thought we'd have a little sort of conversation between us and kind of get things going a bit, um, and then as normal, and then throw it open for kind of questions from the group. So I thought, let's just kind of relatively quickly ask each of you, maybe starting with Rania at the end, um, you know, do you think at the end of this year, by the end of this year, will we be talking about the military defeat of IS? And in a way, 
if we are, or, or we're getting to that stage, what, what does it actually mean? Islamic State, as we all know, is not a new group. It was formed in the aftermath of the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003. The defeat in terms of the territory that it holds might be something, but the defeat of the ideology is something completely different, and it is something that successive Iraqi and uh, U.S. administrations have not been able to do. I remember being in Mosul in 2008, 2009, embedded with the U.S. military, watching them kick in doors, trying to defeat the precursor to the Islamic State, and that obviously did not work. So even if it loses territory, that is merely one part of the battle. The bigger idea is how do you kill the idea? How do you kill the, how, how, you know, the, the, and this idea is obviously fermented in an environment. So how do you uh, make the ground infertile for this group's ideas to take root? And that is the bigger question, rather than these tit-for-tat military uh, offensives. I'm going to press the button. Um, what do you think? Do you, uh, you know, you've particularly been focused on Iraq. What, how do you see things going on the ground right now? And perhaps in particular from Iraq, what does it mean for Iraq, the battle for Mosul? And just to pick up from yeah. what Ronnie said, uh, uh, Daesh, IS, they call themselves the Islamic State. They're the Islamic State. They call themselves the Khmer Rouge. They're the Khmer Rouge. That's what they call themselves. They've been very successful in reducing something very complicated to a very simple idea. Um, you mentioned the precursor, U.S. Uh, soldiers kicking down doors with, uh, I mean, there's a lot of different acronyms you use at the time, AQI, ISI but uh, basically Sunni supremacist uh, extremist groups. Um, where Daesh, IS, Islamic State, have been very successful is they've reduced it to a very simple idea. Before, to, to carry out an operation, Al-Qaeda had a chain of command and a hierarchy. Right now, I could pick up a hammer, shout Allah Akbar, kill everyone here, right? ISIS would say I'm ISIS. You'd say I'm ISIS. The media would say I'm ISIS. The government say I'm ISIS, I'm ISIS. That's their success. Um, to my left is um, Faraz Fayyad, um, Syrian filmmaker, um, now based in Europe most of the time, yeah, um, and uh, who is um, particularly talking at this event um, about his film The Last Men in Aleppo, which um, uh, was won a big documentary award at the Sundance Film Festival about the White Helmets and about the volunteer movements uh, in the siege of Aleppo at the moment. So it's great to have you. Next to Faraz is Ayman Aghana, uh, a British um, photojournalist, filmmaker, um, uh, of Iraqi origin, uh, uh, based all around the place, <laughs> constantly on the move, um, who's worked at the moment is doing a lot of stuff for the BBC, but has worked for the New York Times and Vice News and, and lots of other people as well. And in particular, Ayman's done a lot of work in Iraq, both on the, on the most offensive right now, but, but way before that as well, looking at the different stages of, um, of the operations um, on the ground in Iraq and what it means for the country. And at the end is uh, Rani Rabuzait, who's been journalist in the Middle East for 15 years at least, um, Australian uh, born, but Lebanese origin, um, uh, and has covered the Middle East for a whole variety of publications, um, lots and lots, but, but particularly I remember back at the beginning of the kind of Syrian conflict, particularly for Time magazine, from Beirut, doing lots of um, reporting on undercover trips inside Syria and doing lots of the very kind of early reporting of the opposition movements on the ground and how things were evolving, often in quite